Welcome to Marketing Your Open Source Project. I should preface this by saying I'm wearing my reading glasses, so if I look a little blank and I'm not making eye contact, it's because I can't really see you very well. <laughs> so, what you will learn in this talk is some things about what marketing is and isn't, why you may need it, and how to do it specifically for open source. Uh, I should also say I may run out of time for questions, but if, I, if you have something you want to ask, please feel free. We can have a hallway conversation afterwards. So why you should care about me addressing this topic? I have been working in tech for 30 years. Most of these jobs have been about communicating or helping to others, others to communicate about technology. Some of these jobs have had marketing titles, some have not. Most of them have been about what we now call content, one way or the other. When I started, it was not called content. You may know me from my YouTube channel, which has dozens, if not hundreds, of deeply technical videos on it, uh, various blogs I have run for various companies, social media. You may even have run across a book I co-authored 25 years ago called Publish Yourself on CD-ROM, although nowadays I am a little better known for the books I edit than the book I wrote. I am now the open source content lead at Amazon Web Services, and my specific qualifications for that job are that I have been 11 years in open source and about nine years in cloud at this point. So I'm part of a team at AWS. We are the open source marketing team, although I'm not quite sure what we really call ourselves. Um, we're a team of evangelists and marketers. We are focused on open source at Amazon. Part of our role is to provide connections into the open source communities. We all have quite a lot of open source background. We also provide, we act as consultants internally to help other Amazon teams learn about open source and how to work with and nourish open source communities. Uh, we help with launches of open source projects such as Amazon Coretto, Firecracker, Open Distro for Elasticsearch. My specific job is to tell the whole world what we do in open source mostly at the moment via the AWS open source blog, which I launched it open just before reInvent 2017, and, the, and social media. So that's plenty about me. Now let's talk about you. If you build it, they will come. Uh, you all may be familiar with this line from a 1989 Kevin Costner movie called Field of Dreams about a man who builds a baseball field in his farm in Iowa because a mysterious voice tells him that if he does this, something magical will happen. Uh, many developers think or hope that this will also apply to technology. If I build it, they will come. It just has to be good. Building great code should be enough. Many projects and even a few companies have run on this assumption. And I will say in the movie, Costner gets a magical result. He gets a field full of baseball playing ghosts. Is that what you want for your project? <laughs> uh, but this happens, you may magically get attention to your project without doing anything particular to get that attention, but this happens rarely. And one thing to keep in mind in this scenario is, if somebody else is doing the talking about your technology, they may very well get it wrong. The most, pers the most qualified person in the world to talk about your technology is you. You need to be the one leading that conversation. So let's take a step back and define what we mean by marketing. So this is a very basic, somewhat commercial definition in which marketing is about getting people to exchange their money for your goods or services. A lot of technologists believe that marketing contributes nothing to a real conversation about technology. Um, at worst, they assume that marketing is deliberately manip manipulative or misleading. That can be true, but it doesn't have to be. So even if you don't start out with a bad opinion about marketing, you may be thinking that you don't need it. With open source, I'm not selling anything, so why would I need marketing? You may not be asking directly for money, but you are asking people to give their time and attention, which are very valuable commodities, to support your ideas. So let's expand our definition of marketing. In open source, marketing is about getting people to exchange their time and attention, and sometimes money, for your ideas. 
So maybe at this point I've convinced you that marketing is something you might need. But you're wondering, do I really need it? So consider the following. So this is the growth in the number of repositories on GitHub over, what's that, a little over two years? This is in the environment in which you are competing. That's a lot of competition. So to expand yet again on our definition, marketing open source is about capturing scant attention resources in a very crowded environment. Now, what kind of resources are we talking about here? The main resource you're going to need is people. You need users and you need contributors. Sometimes contributors are the classic person working alone in their basement for the love of it. More often nowadays, contributors are uh, mandated or directly hired by companies to work on a specific project. So you're trying to get the attention of a company there too, not just an individual. Either way, people are still always going to be your primary resource. The other resource you may need is money. Um, could be useful for all of these things. You need the things that money can buy, which is people's time to work on it. So yes, money does come into the equation even when the thing you are selling does not have a price tag. So let's talk about what you can do to start attracting some of these critical, critical resources to your project. You may have heard that Amazon operates according to leadership principles, of which the first and most important, and we take these very seriously, the first and most important is about customers. We always start from the customer. I would argue that this principle can very usefully be applied to any project or product. Your first step should always be to identify your customer. Who is this project designed to serve? Then get very specific about the problem. What is the problem the customer is facing that you are trying to solve with your project? You might find useful an Amazon framework called the PRFAQ, which is a press release that you write for a product or a service or a project before you ever start coding. Before you invest any kind of resources into a project, write a press release as if this is the day of launch and you're telling people what this thing is good for and who it serves. It can also include um, a set of FAQs about how you're going to execute on this. But the most important thing is the customer focus. Talk about how this is going to help the customer. Uh, as your project matures and grows, for every change, patch, or pull request, apply that logic again. What is this specific change going to do to help my customers? If you don't know, Talk to your customers. Always be having those conversations. Be continually refreshing your understanding of what your customer needs and how you're meeting those needs. After you've identified your users and their needs, then you're ready to move on to actual coding, which is the thing I'm actually not going to say much about in this session, partly because I am not a coder, but also because it is the thing that tends to be done well. There are some things you can do to help in open source. Um, for example, you can architect with uh, an open API, which lowers the barriers to entry and increases participation. You can design um, so that a contributor can write a module that they can easily plug in, rather than having to understand your entire code base. In case somebody does need to understand your entire code base, please make that code well commented so they can read through it and get some sense out of it. So many projects stop right there. So here's the code, have fun. Why don't you submit a PR sometime? That is not enough. Um, right away on GitHub, you will get a suggestion. This is essentially a bill of materials for what you should be including when you first launch a project. And this is very good, again, as far as it goes. You can and should do more. This is a project, uh, Style Dictionary was a project that was open sourced by some of my colleagues at Amazon. And they included all of these things to start with. So you can see they're already going well beyond the basics of what GitHub is suggesting. Documentation is absolutely crucial. 
After code, it is the most important thing you can do to attract and retain users to your project and contributors. It's also very difficult to achieve. Um, I know, you know I, I've been to many open source conferences, community leadership conferences, and so on. I've attended a bunch of sessions at which people have said, damn, it's hard to get good documentation done. Coding and writing about code are very different skills. And frankly, the solution I've seen some projects come up with is just to hire an expert to do it. And that is a perfectly valid option. Uh, again, that's where money comes in. So what is good documentation? Very broadly, it explains what you can do with the software, the commands, parameters, explaining the output, how to interpret the output, where and how to use it, use cases. Bonus points if it looks good, because stylish documentation is easier for humans to read and absorb. There is nothing wrong with looking pretty. For documentation to be good, in the sense that I just explained, is actually still not enough. Your documentation and every other piece of material that you create about your project should help people to understand what your technology is about. But more importantly, how they can use it to kick ass. Now this principle comes from Kathy Sierra, who used to run a wonderful blog called Creating Passionate Users. She said, don't just tell users how awesome your project is. Tell them how awesome they can be using it. Better yet, teach them how to be awesome with it. So now we'll get into the nitty gritty of what are the different kinds of content and other options you can use to help teach people how to be awesome with your technology. Um, so this is just a, a kind of a table of contents of some things we're gonna go through. And that is not an exhaustive list, by the way. There's always more. So whatever term you use for them, there are lots of different terms and styles of technical papers. They've been used at different ways by different companies at different times across the industry. So don't get hung up on whether this is a white paper or a blueprint or a use case or whatever. I'm talking generally about a category of deeply technical content, and which can include things like use cases, architectures, how-tos, et cetera. It could be shared in various ways. It could be a blog post, it could be a paper that gets downloaded, it can be a conference talk, um, but it should be rich and it should be deep. My recent experience with the AWS open source blog is that our audience has a huge appetite for deeply technical content and they love hands-on exercises. You know, there's a sort of a conventional wisdom that a blog post should not be longer than X. One of our most popular recent posts was 4,600 words on using, uh, running open distro for elastic search on Kubernetes, which was, and in this specific case, it was applications to security because it was written by a security engineer at Ring. You know, Ring are the people who have those doorbell cameras, so they want to protect that data very, very well. Um, and this post, very deep, very hands-on, very popular. So again, don't just tell people what your technology can be used for. Tell them how they can use it show them how they can use it to kick ass. Yes, you should definitely have a blog. Um, again, there is no canonical length, there's no canonical blog type. You can use it for how-tos, technical deep dives, release announcements, events, news snippets. Anything that is of interest to your audience is fair game for your blog. Uh, just, and there, as I said, there's no canonical length. Use the number of words you need to cover that topic, no more and no less. Um, if you've got a lot of text, break it up with code, with images, with headings, and so on. Make it, again, make it pretty, make it easier for humans to understand. If somebody confronts a wall of text, they, uh, they will go away uh, without reading it. Uh, another thing to keep in mind, a uh, drawback with blogs is that blogs were not originally created, they were created as a chronological phenomenon. Chronology is not necessarily the best way for a person to find what they're looking for on a specific topic. So use everything at your disposal, like categories and tags and menus, to help people narrow down on a specific topic within your blog. Video. Uh, has been increasingly popular over the last, what, 10, 15 years. Uh, again, 
There are so many different things you can do with video that I hesitate to call it a category unto itself. Uh, you know, screen shares, tutorials, whatever. However, the drawback is that attention spans have gotten shorter and shorter, and most videos, nobody gets past minute three. So it's probably not worth your time to be doing 40-minute videos unless you are a YouTube gamer whom nine-year-olds enjoy. Um, I have a nine-year-old. I know about this. Um, do put it on YouTube for findability. There's lots of cross-traffic on YouTube, for better and for worse. Um, Subtitles and captions, if you can do them, are great for accessibility. They are also great for any portion of your audience whose first language is not the language you're doing a video in. There are many people in the world who can read a second language better than they can understand it's spoken. The trade press, both online and what is left of the print, uh, is still valuable. However, this is something you probably do want expert help on because press PR, press relations, is really about press relationships. And unless you've been around for a long time, you may not have those. The news sites, such as Hacker News and Reddit. There's always a temptation to game these because they can get you a lot of traffic. Don't try it. Uh, they are really not tameable beasts, and any attempt to game them usually backfires on you. At the very least, least you're going to get downvoted or get your post removed altogether. Um, however, when it happens, it's great. You can get a ton of traffic, and it's a good idea to be in there carefully monitoring what is said and responding without trying to get into the usual hacker news heated argument. <laughs> um, but, you know, d defend yourself and give them the truth if that is needed. For some projects and technologies, uh, there are a few refereed journals out there for our field, and getting articles into them can be helpful, uh, maybe appropriate. Be aware that even a short article for one of these can be quite a lot of work. This is basically publishing in a scholarly journal, and that entails a great deal of work. Books are a great marketing tool, and possibly very often a career boost. Uh, be aware that a book is an insane amount of work. It may go out of date pretty quickly, and not all tech books are successful. Even the ones that are successful, you probably are not going to make money in proportion to the amount of time you spent. Um, but again, it's great for reputation. It's great for really getting in-depth on a technology. Um, yes, this is a new book from Brendan Gregg that was announced on Monday, and yes, I edited this one too. A logo, uh, especially a cute logo with personality, is a great asset to have. You can make it into stickers, t-shirts, and other swag, which people will want even if they're not using your thing. They'll think it's cute, they'll want to put it on their laptop, and that's free advertising. Um, this is the Style Dictionary Chameleon. Other good examples are the Docker Whale, the GitHub Octocat. I'm sure most of us have at least one of those stickers on us. And it's, they're cute and they're extensible. You can dress them up in clothing or whatever. Um, Days-long classroom training is not as common as it used to be. It's been replaced by online tutorials, interactive videos-based courses, shorter tutorials being given, for example, in conjunction with OzCon. Those are all great. Again, it's all about helping your customers learn how to kick ass with your technology. So you may be wondering, when you set out to create any of these kinds of content, how much time it's likely to take. So here is a handy chart. Um, a lot of this data comes from my partner, Brendan, because he is a performance engineer, and he measures everything, including every hour that he spends writing a book or a blog post. Um, there's a couple things in there that I have done and he has not, so this was a collaborative effort here. Um, and frankly, this looks pretty daunting, and you may be wondering how you're ever going to get started creating this kind of content. But there are some shortcuts, places you can look for inspiration and answers. Uh, a rule of thumb I've been operating by for most of my career is if I've had to answer the same customer question three times, it needs to be put somewhere that people can find it, whether that's a wiki or a blog post or whatever. 
So in the long run, you're going to probably save yourself time by giving a definitive answer in some definitive place. Speaking of places, you're creating content. You need a place to put it. So you've got a lot of options. Um, you know, your GitHub repo, necessary but not sufficient. You can do GitHub pages. You can do your own websites and pages. There are advantages and disadvantages to all these things. But wherever you decide to put content, you're going to want to put some work into helping people find it and driving traffic to it. And over time, you will find that most of your traffic is going to come from the search engines. This is true of everybody across the board, even Amazon. Um, so you will need to know something about search engine optimization. And this is an arcane art with best practices that change constantly. Um, extremely broadly, the way to get attention from search engines is to keep putting out new content, keep it fresh. Um, with the right keywords. Code and documentation is a really good place to start for search engines, but again, you keep developing more content because it's going to help you here. If you have a project that has been sitting still for six months and your, you know, your readme and whatever is all you've got and nothing's been updated, Google's going to lose interest in you. <clears throat> for both search engines and humans, there are lots of tools available, to, again, to help with findability. Make sure you're using all these. Uh, you know, things like YouTube tags will help people find your video in a category. And of course, you can always go out and search. There's lots of information out there about SEO. And uh, all done by people who know about it and are competing with each other for attention. <clears throat> Meetups, talks, and conferences are useful both to generate content and to share it. So think of your presentations as content and use the same tools and techniques to drive traffic, attendance, et cetera, to those talks. If you, uh, hopefully, at some point, your talks will get recorded, and then you have yet more content which you can use. Social media is always useful for getting traffic. It's also a great place to have a conversation when you don't get too technically deep. Um, there's always going to be arguments about which social media, cha media channel is best for which kind of topic. And it really is going to depend on your audience. Um, you know, I would have said until a few days ago that I wouldn't bother too much with trying to reach developers on Facebook. Well, what if I want to reach Facebook developers? They are on Facebook. <laughs> and they are using it for all the things. So it really depends. Um, don't discount anything. Keep your, keep your eye on things and see as new uh, social media platforms potentially come along. LinkedIn is actually surprisingly effective, um, in part because that's your professional network. People have the same professional interests as you. They're likely to be interested in what you have to say. Uh, there's all different ways and places for people to have discussions. This is where you need to know who your community is and go find them. And monitor things because like some communities still like IRC, some communities like Slack, some like Stack Overflow. You have to go to them. You can't force them to come to your preferred mode of communication. So you could leave this talk right now. Please don't, but you could. Um, and you would have gained, I hope, some useful knowledge. But I've been doing this for a long time, and I'm going to let you in on my biggest secret which has guided most of my career. Everything that touches the customer is marketing. Everything. So as an example, think about air travel. Every time you get on a plane, that represents an entire experience in which every touch point, every interaction, every little thing that happens colors your experience of that particular trip even though a lot of it is not under control of the airline, eventually, you, uh, everybody has a chance to screw this up and ruin your day. Let's put it that way. <laughs> um, the same is true for your project. The experience of your open source project includes every piece of code, content, and collateral. It also includes every interaction with every person involved. It all matters. 
So this is why a healthy community is important. It's an important part of the overall experience of your project. You need a code of conduct, and you need to enforce it. Diversity matters. Open source is less diverse even than tech overall, which is already not good. And frankly, that is really stupid. We are all missing out on great potential contributors because of this. Some communities have been successful because they have worked from the beginning to be inclusive. Also think about diversity of contribution. Make sure that you are understood to value other kinds of contribution than just code. Responsiveness. If someone asks a question that reports a bug or submits a PR, do they get an answer fairly quickly? When they get that answer, is it a kind answer? Or is it RTFM? Related to that, just take a second to digest that piece of information. 50% of respondents to the GitHub open source survey had witnessed bad behavior in open source. And they said that's often enough to keep them away from a particular project or community. Do not tolerate brilliant jerks in your community. They are costing you far more than their contributions are worth. And the catch is, of course, you will never know about the contributions you lost out on because a brilliant jerk drove someone away. So let's go back to this definition. I said that everything that touches the customer is marketing. Now think about that. If everything that touches the customer is marketing, you're already doing marketing. The question is, are you doing it well? So that is that, and I do actually have time for questions. And I've got a few references here you might want to look at. And I'll put my other glasses on so I can see you all. Take your picture so I can show there were people in here. <laughs> Hi, I have a question and a comment. Yes. Uh, you said right now that you're better known for your editing than for your writing. Could you just speak a moment on the value of having editors for your bloggers and whether or not you consider that important? Absolutely. And, and the comment is uh, for people that are involved in a nonprofit operation, uh, Google will provide up to like thousands of dollars in free ad revenue, uh, google.com slash grants. We found it worked very, very well for us. That is very good to know. Thank you. Yes, absolutely. Editing is important. Um, in fact, I don't do much direct writing myself on the AWS Open Source blog. My main job is to be an editor and to make sure that the, the quality of the writing and the clarity and so forth is up to Amazon's high standards. Um, at the very least, you know, you, obviously you may not have a professional editor involved in your project, but everything you write, get another set of eyes on it, because just having somebody who's not as close to it as you can really help a lot with catching bad writing or you know, silly stuff, grammatical errors and so on. Um, so yes, thank you for that. Hi, thank you. Thank you, I enjoyed your talk. Um, thank you. And um, I agree with you completely about um, everything that um, uh, everything involves the customer. I was surprised that you um, didn't raise the area of product management as opposed to product marketing, because the I mean the issues are very much the same. Some of the wishes come from the comments in the forums, and some of it comes from committers, and some of it comes from platform requirements. And I wondered. Um, how you fit um, this notion of product management into your, into your picture? That's also a very good question. Um, I am not a product manager and never have been. So I tend to take this from the customer service and marketing side. But yeah, I think you know, the, the Amazon approach that I was talking about earlier with the PRFAQ and starting from defining what the customer, who the customer is and what you're doing for them, that all that tends to be done by product managers, not by marketers. Yeah, um, and yeah, and our product managers are under our marketers. Uh, and for a project, you know, you, when it's a project that you yourself are starting and launching, and also this sometimes applies to open source done in companies, you may find yourself wearing all those hats. 
which is not necessarily a bad thing, at least in the beginning. Um, you know, again, you are the person who is going to know best your technology. So sit down and define for yourself who the customers are, what problem you're addressing. And you know, you're, you're doing all those things in the beginning. But you know, again, it doesn't have to be, don't be scared off by that. A lot of it is stuff that is going to be good for you to do regardless, even if you don't think of yourself as a marketer, it's gonna help you clarify your thinking. I've got one here and one here. Hi, so AWS is a slightly large company, uh, but for a healthy community, I think you're looking for more than just Amazon's involvement in the open source project. So how do you keep from overwhelming a particular community with the bigness that is Amazon? Up to now, I don't know that it's been a problem. Um, you know, we are fairly large contributors to a few key projects. If you look at, um, we have a page, opensource.amazon.com, which is also another thing I do when I have time, which lists just a few of the projects we contribute to. Um, I think you know, most big companies these days that are contributing to open source at all are doing the same things. And I think most of those communities are pretty, if they are, you know, existing communities like, I don't know, Apache Lucene, that's been around for a while. Many different country, companies contribute to it. Amazon happens to, and it's not even AWS, but the Amazon side happens to employ one of the big committers there. But I don't, you know, he's been in that community for a long time, and so, and this is what, what part of what you can do is to hire people who are already part of the community and they know how to regulate themselves vis-a-vis -vis that community. They don't want to mess it up either because they may leave Amazon, but they're still going to be in that community most likely. Uh, so finding people who already know open source is helpful and then training the ones who don't. Thank you. And this gentleman here in the red shirt. Thank you for the talk today. Uh, I had a question. Do you have any tips in differentiating between a project that has potential but poor marketing versus just a bad project? I know that's not exactly an easy yeah, question. Yeah, it's. Um, I would say there are a lot of projects out of there out there that have suffered from lack of marketing. Um, I am not technologically qualified to judge whether most of them are technically great, but I do know. I mean, for example, in Linux, there's actually relatively little marketing of anything in Linux. Um, you know, the Linux Foundation, I don't think they really consider that they do conferences. But, you know, these other things to market a technology, I don't think they consider part of their mandate. Um, so there's, I mean, you know, close to home is Linux Tracing because I live with them and about to marry Brendan Gregg. Um, you know, so I hear a lot about that and his take has been that Sun Microsystems did well early on with Dtrace partly because they put a lot of marketing into it. Whereas the Linux tracers have never had any consistent marketing except from him. Um, so I think there's probably quite a few technologies that languish undeservedly because they just, you know, there's been no marketing effort put into them at all. And if that's, and if one of those is your project, I'm sorry, you know, this is, this is part of why I'm doing this, to try to help people get the word out about things that could be great, they're just not known. Anyone else? Hi, thank you. Uh, this is probably along the same lines. So in your experience, uh, what, what would you say are like key differentiators in open source projects that succeed versus ones that fail? It's really, it's, it's really I, all of the above. It's, you know, all of those things go, I mean, you know, obviously you, you have to have great code. That's your baseline. Uh, or at least code that potentially could be made great with lots of help you have to be answering a problem that people actually have and want to solve. But you also need to have a healthy community and strong documentation and some amount of marketing, whether that's in the form of random individuals writing blog posts. I mean, also, yeah, another thing about marketing is it's not always all done by you. You, know, you may have other people who, you know, somebody comes out of nowhere and puts a great blog post up on their personal site or on Medium or wherever that, you know, is how to do X with my project. By all means, help to amplify that. As it, it gives you actually more credibility 
when other people are talking about your stuff. So you know, encourage it, amplify it. Um, but it, you know, with any technology succeeding, it tends to be a combination of all the magic ingredients. All right, thank you all so much. Thank you.